good afternoon, everyone. We are extremely happy to welcome you today for this second session of the Daylight Awareness Week 2021. My name is Lydia Moreno, and I am the program manager of the Daylight Academy, which is the organization behind this event. The title for this whole Awareness Week is Three Reasons Why We Need Daylight. And yesterday we had our first talks, which were dedicated to the biological effects of daylight. We learned what happens in the body when we receive more or less light and how important natural light is to regulate our body functions, but also to synchronize our body clocks with the environment. We also heard that the health benefits of daylight should be taken into consideration when designing buildings and cities to have healthy um, living environments. Today, we take a step further and ask ourselves what happens when we don't get enough daylight. And we have the privilege to have three brilliant health experts with us today who will show us through different examples that a lack of daylight can unfortunately cause illness in certain cases. The good news is when we are aware of that, we can also prevent some of these diseases and improve our well being by trying to get the light we need. Before we start, um, I will quickly explain what the Delat Academy is for those who don't know the organization yet. The Academy is an international membership organization bringing together scientists from very different disciplines, architects, engineers and actually all kinds of professionals working with daylight-related topics or involved in daylight research. It has been initiated and it is supported by the Swiss foundation Veluk Stiftung. What we mainly do is organize different conferences and meetings where all these specialists can meet, can exchange and get inspired from each other. Through this interdisciplinary approach, we want to foster innovation and generate new research ideas related to daylight, of course. Another important goal of the Academy is to disseminate this knowledge to the public and create more awareness of these questions. And that's what we are doing today with this public event. I also would like to invite you as participants to be active during the session. It is meant to be interactive and you will have different opportunities to contribute. So don't hesitate to ask all your questions to the speakers. And for that, please use the question and answer tool of the Q&A function that you can find at the bottom of your screen. And there you can write your questions at any time. And you can also vote for the questions you find particularly interesting from other, other participants. And the question with the most likes will, be, will appear on the top and will be prioritized by the moderator. So don't hesitate to use this, uh, this tool. And please also keep your smartphone close by because uh, we will also ask you some questions at different moments. And for that, we will use another tool called Mentimeter and it will be easier for you to answer using your phone. Another thing I would like to mention is that we have a great team in the background. So they are working in the shadows today, but they were essential for the whole organization. And today they are making sure that everything works smoothly. So thank you to Marion from the Veluk Stiftung and to Laura and June, both members of the consulting organization, SenseTribe. Please also note that the webinar is being recorded, that we are live on YouTube right now, and that the video will be available on the Delight Academy website in a few days, if you are interested. So now we can start with the talks and I'm happy to introduce the moderator of this session, which is Dr. Marielle Art. Marielle is an assistant professor in the Department of the Built Environment at the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands, where she specializes in lights and lighting, particularly in relation to humans and the built environment. Besides, she is also a steering committee member of the Daylight Academy, so we are lucky to have her facilitating 
the discussion today and I'm happy to hand over to her. Marielle, please, the floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon. My apologies for getting used to the system as well. So I want to first of all, welcome you all for, for joining uh, us on this uh, um, event here. So a warm welcome to, to, to you by spending also your time behind the screen again. I'm sorry for that. And most likely it will be indoors. And I'm extremely happy that you have uh, raised the interest uh, to join this meeting and hopefully share some new insights that we can do with uh, about daylight and about being outdoors in the sunlight and why it's so important for your health. And certainly that has, has been a topic of health uh, for everyone uh, on, on each other's mind for the previous years, especially during this pandemic. And I can assure you there is light at the end of this tunnel and our speakers will also explain why that light is most likely even daylight. Um, well, first of all, um, so, so welcome you all. Uh, we will first hear something about uh, um, daylight in relation to our visual health, health specifically for children and uh, the development of myopia by Richard Hobday. Um, this uh, will be followed by a presentation about daylight in relation as like it also to mental health by uh, uh, Francesco Benedetti. And finally, did you actually know that there is a correlation between daylight and diabetes? Uh, that is what we will be hearing uh, in the presentation from uh, Charna uh, Dipna. Um, well, normally we, of course, would like to welcome you all. Um, and uh, the aim, of course, is not only to send you information and a lot of interesting information, hopefully, but also rather tap into your questions as well. So use uh, what Lydia also um, mentioned, use the Q&A function in Zoom and write those, those questions down. And after each presentation, we still have some time to discuss and to, to ask the speaker um, their question. Uh, another thing, because we also want to create a bit more of an open atmosphere, um, and normally we have some kind of introduction around, but obviously with this number of people, that's not possible. And that's why um, we want to, to get to know you a bit better. And that's why we would like to ask you some questions specifically about you and therefore I would um, ask if you can uh, go to uh, www.menti.com and use your smartphone on that one or if you have a double screen you can also use your double screen and then you can uh, use the codes so the codes that you can see on this screen is 62638063 and there you will find um, some questions. So I'll just have a, uh, just wait a little bit. So you have the opportunity at least to, to um, get into the system. Ah, you already are. So I already see some answer, answers to the first question. So the first one is of course, from which country are you joining us? And now we can see quite easily where you all come from so that we at least have some ideas that we're not only from the Netherlands or Switzerland and that we can also see that we're quite international, not only Europe I see, so I see also many countries um, outside Europe, so that's good. So Netherlands, Switzerland, Sweden. So um, welcome to you all. Very pleased to see that. I'll just wait a sec to, to also give you all the opportunities. So I'm pleased to see such an international uh, group has actually joined us here. Okay, so that, that's at least good to see. So then I will ask um, to go to the next question. And that is, what is the first word that comes to your mind when you think of lack of daylight? And of course, it can be also um, different answers to that question as well. Well, we start quite depressive, depression, sadness, mood, okay. So we're in the, in the mental um, phase in this case. Winter sickness, low energy, blues. So 
many of you related to kind of mental health, maybe seasonal affective disorders. I see winter, circadian, gloom, dull. Oh. Do I see any positive thing? No, lack of daylight. Good night. Good night. That's a positive thing, yeah. Lack of sleep. <laughs> lack of daylight. Denmark. Now I'm curious, of course. <laughs> Maybe we can find out what that means, actually. Lack of sleep, fatigue. Okay, so it is, well, you already are mid. Maybe... Um, prejudice about daylight, but anyway, so that's also why you might be joining. And the last question for this Mentimeter session is, what do you hope to get out of this session? So what are your hopes and, and how can we, um, maybe we can actually fulfill those. And new information, of course, to learn new perspectives. So it's more informative, thinking about health, new research, the relations between diabetes, new information, wonderful to learn. So you're actually here to, to learn connections. That's also good also to see maybe um, uh, what these, these, these excellent researchers are actually doing to connect to those cool stuff. Okay. Well, the expectations are quite high. So let's see if and how we can fulfill those more in depth, so it's a lot of information, of course. But of course, I also invite you to, if you want to learn, ask those questions and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to um, uh, send them to the speakers as well. And so hopefully we'll get even more specific information that you're looking for. Reasonable funding for daylight planning, meeting researchers, enlightenment, and all of new knowledge. So. That's, that's at least good to know and also to see uh, what your interests actually are. Um, so therefore, I want to thank you at least for this first part about sh and sharing also that information with us. Um, so now I suggest we will actually go to the first speaker. So our first speaker of today is um, Dr. Uh, Richard Hobday um, from the UK. Uh, he's a writer, independent researcher, and an engineer, and he got fascinated by daylights when working on passive solar collectors and was studying the building tradition before we had electrical light. In relation to the human health, from an historic perspective, he showed us his lesson, that the lessons can be learned from, from that one as well, and also how to reintroduce daylight in our building tradition for good health. And he recently is also focusing more on the global health Threats and among which, uh, and that's what he will be talking about, myopia. So, Richard, if you could start your presentation, it would be wonderful. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, so, uh, what is myopia? Why is it a problem? And what is its relationship with daylight or lack of it? So, if I could have the first slide, I'll. Um, I'll show you the, uh, the myopic eye. And what happens with myopia is that the eye is misshapen, it lengthens. And that means that light focuses in front of the retina rather than on it, which means that vision is blurred. And that was uh, first discovered and defined by the astronomer uh, Johannes Kepler 400 years ago. And Kepler said it was a problem of children. Uh, young people who do too much close work. And as you'll see at the top of the slide, it says school myopia, because it was always known as school myopia, or widely known as school myopia, because that's where it was known to happen in schools. And it still is referred to that in, in, in many documents and cases. So schools are where most myopia occurs. And if we look at the next slide, I'll try and explain why that's a problem. So... Uh, if we could have the next image, that would be good. Right, so when I was at school 50 years ago, um, when we left, the chances of being myopic was about, it was about 20% of, of pupil, of students left. So it was a minority. 
Now it's in Europe and uh, North America, it's about 50%. So it's more than doubled in 50 years. Um, elsewhere, it's increased more rapidly, particularly in East and Southeast Asia, where it's now um, affecting 70 to 90% of, of, of young adults, teenagers. Uh, in, in many countries, um, you see it's almost uh, unusual for somebody to leave school without being short-sighted in some of these countries now. Um, very common problem. Um, globally, uh, currently about a quarter of the world's population is short-sighted. And according to one recent estimate, if current trends continue, then we'll get uh, half the world's population short-sighted. And the, so, why, so why is that a problem? Is really the question, uh, and, and the, pr the problem is that, that myopia, short-sightedness, is a leading cause of blindness. So um, it, it means that if you've got half the world's population short-sighted, there will be a lot of people who are uh, visually disabled, um, because high levels of myopia, if you have severe myopia, you are at risk of, of permanent vision loss. And uh, in effect, any level of myopia does increase your, your risk of, of visual problems. So if I could have the next slide, I'll try and explain a little bit about 50 years ago. When I was at school, uh, classrooms were still designed to stop children becoming short-sighted. So they had um, big windows on the left side of the classroom. Uh, and there was a requirement, a legal requirement, certainly in the 1950s, to meet a minimum daylight standard, which was the, uh, the um, daylight factor. So there's a, a daylight factor requirement uh, for skylighting the classrooms. And it was always on the left. The light came in from one wall, which was in, almost entirely glazed, in from the left. So all the right-handed pupils, all the right-handed students could see to write. They, they weren't writing in shadow. Um, also, uh, schools at that time, you were not allowed to stay in the classroom when there weren't lessons. You were supposed to be outside during recesses or breaks between lessons. During the lunch break, uh, you were supposed to be outside. And there were playing fields all the way around the school. So you were always outside playing games. Now, uh, I didn't know, and a lot of people I suspect who were doing uh, in schools at that time didn't know why schools were designed for this. So I spent a lot of time trying to find it out. And eventually I found the paper on all this was based. So if we could have the next slide, I'll explain who was responsible for this. Um, and it was a Professor Herman Cohn, who was a uh, professor of ophthalmology at Breslau University in uh, Prussia, as it then was. Prussia had a compulsory state education. Uh, it was the first modern state to do so, I think. And uh, Cohn did the first large scale study to find out what happened to children's eyesight in a system like that. So he, he measured the eyesight of 10,000 children and he found some interesting things. Um, the first was that uh, the longer they were, the long, more time they spent in school, the more likely they were to become short-sighted. Then he looked at the more academic schools in Prussia, the, the, the uh, gymnasium or high schools. And again, uh, year on year, there was an increase in myopia and it became more severe amongst some of the pupils. And by the time they'd spent six years in a gymnasium, 50% or more were short-sighted. Uh, and he then went on to find that uh, he'd looked at schools in, in rural areas and in towns and found that it was about four to five times more myopia or short-sightedness in the towns than in rural areas. And he then looked at the location of the schools and found that schools in uh, narrow streets had very high levels and he attributed this to the overshading of the classroom. So they were very dark classrooms. He measured light levels in classrooms and came to the conclusion that um, the, the, the cause of myopia was uh, low levels of daylight. So he then recommended that, um, that schools should be designed for as much daylight as possible. And he set a standard, which was um, the windows should be at least one fifth uh, ratio of the floor area. Uh, and that's where all this thinking came from. And one of the things he observed was that some myopia was genetic. It was inherited. There was a tendency. But he said most of it was not. It was environmental. So if we move to the next slide, you'll see what else was going on in the 1960s. Um, by that time, medical thinking had changed and it had reversed. And the argument was that most of myopia was inherited 
very little of it was environmental. So the idea that um, daylight protected uh, went. And the other thing that happened in the 1960s was that the fluorescent tube was introduced and it was promoted on the basis that it was just as healthy as daylight in a building. Prior to that, daylight always had primacy in schools and hospitals. But from the 60s onwards, the fluorescent tube was its equivalent. And so we ended up with windowless classrooms in many countries, particularly in the United States. Next slide, please, if you can. So where are we now? We'll skip forward um, 50 years or so. And research is looking at some of the things that were looked at uh, way back then. And we now know uh, conclusively that myopia is caused by intensive uh, education at a young age, um, putting children into school and making them work very hard and doing so with limited time outdoors is really uh, another factor in it. Randomized controlled trials show that um, two hours outdoors a day can reduce myopia by about 50%. Um, and also what is happening is countries like China are introducing policies where children have to go outside for two hours a day to try and bring down their problem of myopia. And, and, and uh, I think Taiwan and Singapore have, have similar policies too. Uh, in the next slide, we'll see another thing that's been uh, looked at is daylight in schools. And this is a bright light experimental classroom set up to see if what uh, the, the effects of daylight are on, on myopia in, in school children as they study. And as you'll see, one of the features of this is it has a translucent ceiling. And that was one of the things that Herman Cohn said would be a good idea to get light down from above, because it means the left-handed people get as much bright light as the right-handed people. Um, and so to uh, finish, uh, I, better, I better stop there. Um, Myopia is a global health problem, and it probably doesn't get as much recognition in the West as it's getting in, in East and Southeast Asia. Uh, time outdoors in daylight does um, protect against it. Uh, we know daylight protects, but at the moment we don't know why it protects, which is one of the things that uh, we're looking at. So thank you very much for your time. I hope that was interesting. All right. Thank you very much, Richard, for your um, presentation about myopia and, of course, a lot of questions that, that, that are still out there, I think. Um, I'm just also looking at the chat, so there are some, some questions from the audience, and I, of course, invite everyone to, to maybe add some more questions, so please do so. Um, so one of the questions um, here is, uh, are there critical years for protecting against myopia? So assuming also that it is most likely also related to age, as you also explained. So can you answer that question maybe or elaborate Yeah, I, I mean, the, 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 young, the youngest years are the most uh, critical um, because uh, if it starts when a child is very young, it has time to progress to a more severe, more severe level. Uh, so um, it's a sort of kindergarten age and, and, and primary school age is that, that appears to be the, the, where, where the damage is done, if you like. So um, that's when children should really be out, outdoors playing and not, uh, not doing too much work indoors and, and doing uh, exams and so on, if, if, if their sight is to be preserved. Okay, thank you. And, and do you think that is also related to the, 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 at the time where children, of course, grow and also the growth of the eye in that sense, or? Um, yes, possibly. Um, uh, and that's not so much, uh, not something I've so much looked at. It's, it's more the actually, again, the environment. If, if you put the child at that age in the, in, the, in the wrong environment, then you're putting them at risk of myopia, which, as I say, will, will, will progress and have more time to progress. Okay. Um, another question that we have here from the audience is that um, can I be protected by wearing glasses? And in addition to that one also, what about blue glasses? So wearing those glasses, would it be harmful or would it be helpful? So there are two uh, questions actually. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, glasses um, obviously improve your vision. But um, as to whether they actually stop further myopia pr progression, uh, that's another question. Um, and I guess that very much depends on how you use your eyes, really, and, and, and how much work you do and, and other factors. So, yes, you need them to see, clearly. Um, but um, 
And as to blue blue lenses, well, I, I, that I don't know. I mean, for some people, possibly blue light is beneficial. For other people, blue light is harmful. So it very much depends on the condition of your eyes. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. So another question that we have here is, does light exposure in the morning versus in the afternoon, would that make a difference? Or is there anything known about that one maybe? Um, as far as myopia is concerned, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I can't say, no. I mean, I know in other areas of daylight research, morning exercise, morning activity, is considered more beneficial than, than at any other time. Certainly combining exercise with daylight is, is, is best first thing in the morning from what I know. Um, whether that's the case with myopia, I don't know. And I don't think anybody's researched it. So um, if they have, do get in touch. <laughs> Good other question there, yeah. Um, another more specific question. Um, Let's see, what is the level, also the, yeah, the amount of light that should enter the eyes if, uh, and for how long do we know that? Uh, well, that's, that again, that's a, that, that's, a, that's a research question. I mean, I mean, there are different papers saying different things on how much light you need and how long the exposure has to be. And uh, I mean, as I say, as, as what we know is if you're outside and, you, and you're, you're, you're young and you're outside, it, it, it protects you. And, and um, the question is, how do you, illuminate a classroom to uh, reproduce those conditions is one of the big questions. And whether it's possible, as Cohen suggested, uh, whether it's possible to, to make a difference. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's another big question. I'm afraid I'm not answering many of your questions, am I? <laughs> Let's see if we can find a, a, a question where we, because there are quite some questions related to that one. I also asking yeah, okay. about, what yeah. about sleep protection? Isn't going outdoors, isn't that related to having a longer view in that sense? Is, is that a prote protective factor? Oh, so yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the, the problem with it is it, it is multifactorial. So it isn't just, I suspect, uh, from what I've seen, it isn't just the daylight itself. It's, it's, it's the conditions in which you are when you're getting the daylight and what you're doing when you're getting the daylight. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to... to um, to uh, distinguish between the different factors at the moment. But everybody's trying to look at it and find out what, what are the important ones. Is it, because of course, a view in a classroom was always considered a valuable thing. Uh, it was a break from looking at, at the blackboard and studying. You could look out of the window at a view of nature and that would be a restful thing. And then when, when windowless classrooms came in, one of, the, one of the rationales for that was it stopped children looking out of the window. So there's that, that, I mean, that, that might be also the conclusion of your, your message. So there, there, there we know that daylight or going outdoors ha has a protective factor, but how exactly those different mechanisms uh, work together, that's still a question to be all. Is that correct? If I yes, can... very, very much so, yes. Okay, good so, good, good so in Dutch and, and English. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for, for okay. um, uh, this session and also the audience for, for the, the many questions that, that you have. Um, I would like to uh, go to the, the next uh, uh, speaker in, in this case. Um, so uh, we will go to uh, listen to the presentation uh, um, from, um, I'm sorry, I have to get my own notes there, from uh, Dr. Francesco Benedetti, and he is combining research and clinical work in Hospital San Raffaele in Milan, in the fields of psychiatry and clinical neurosciences. And his main research interests are within the field of translational and reverse translational psychiatry. So I also hope that you could explain something about that because that's something that I don't know exactly what that means. Um, linking the clinical work and the research, and he aims to develop new treatment techniques based on the administration of environmental stimuli, as such, daylight maybe, uh, to synchronize the biological clock. So, Dr. Uh, Benedetti, if you could give your presentation. Okay, I think you can see me, and let's share my presentation. First of all, thanks to all the organizers for having me here, for inviting me. I noticed that, that uh, several people said uh, 
uh, that sadness and depression were among the first words that came into their mind when speaking of lack of daylight. And that's exactly what I will speak about here and those about the possibility to correct these things. I'm uh, the leader of the research unit in psychiatry and clinical psychobiology of the Ospedale San Raffaele in Milano, and, uh, and I am professor of psychiatry in my university, University Vita Salute San Raffaele. I have absolutely, as you can see here, no conflict of interest to declare, and uh, my researchers are being funded by public uh, entities, and I like to stay in the daylight, uh, definitely, but I don't need to be paid to stay there. And so let's start with this talk, and this is what happens to you when you arrive in Tokyo and you look uh, at the uh, underground map? It's quite scary, but the most scary thing probably is this line. This is the Yamanote line, you can see it. It goes all around the center of Tokyo and it's the preferred line for suicides because uh, trains go very, very quickly there and so there are no possibilities to be saved if you jump uh, on the line. And if you arrive there when there is no daylight uh, in the tracks, uh, when, the, when, the tube, when the train is out of the tube or into the stations, you can see the people who uh, switch on this kind of very terribly looking blue powerful light. And when they did this, the Japanese researchers uh, noticed that uh, you can see here, uh, nearly 83% of um, uh, suicides decreased in the Yamanote line. They did a second study because somebody said, okay, but probably they will go in another station to jump in. That was not true, okay? Suicides were reduced of 70% among all the uh, underground stations uh, of uh, Tokyo. And uh, you can see here an interview to the director of security of the Gatwick Airport, who says, well, I don't know why it works, but it works. So we will put blue lights everywhere. They started also in Scotland to put the blue lights, as you can see here, in the crossroads, where, who, which were preferred by suicide people. Looking at the light, when you are thinking of killing yourself, apparently decreases your will of killing yourself. That should be hard to believe, but look at here. These are all the factors that influence the annual rate of suicide in a country, the primary industry percentage, which we like so much now, and then the annual total sunshine, the annual individual income, the sex, the age, how many psychiatrists are available, as you can see here, sunlight beats everything. It's the most important factor in predicting suicide over one year. This is my hospital. And as you can see here, there is a war, which a ward which goes north to south. And so one of the faces is exposed to east. When we looked at the time spent for recovering from depression as inpatients uh, during the seasons, we observed over years and years of observation that patients who had been hospitalized in the east wing went home earlier than patients who had been hospitalized for depression on the west wing. And this was because they received light in the morning. So in the winter, when there is no light in the morning, there was no difference. In spring, it started. And in summer and in fall, when there is probably the highest sensitivity to this mechanism, uh, the advantage was obvious. These had already been done in Canada some years before, and this was confirmed in Spain some years after. So it should be true. Also considering that new clinics try now to rejuvenate all the, the areas and make lamps in order to obtain the same effects of daylight. And in general, people hospitalized into hospitals you can see, you can look here, there is a lot of literature, need less painkillers, need less uh, sleeping pills if they are sleeping in the beds next to the windows. So if they receive light in the morning. And this attracted uh, attention because of course, even the Financial Times magazine sent uh, one of their uh, reporters to look at what we were doing because uh, that sped up recovery from depression, that, uh, 
was a way of also sparing money in treating the patients and having them staying well rapidly. You can see here a very old lamp we had at those times. Now we have much better instruments to deliver light therapy when sunlight is not available. And you, here you can see that now the American Psychiatric Association and the Cochrane Collaboration concludes that light treatment for depression is efficacious with the same effect size of uh, pharmacotherapy. And when you combine light and treatments with drugs, they are much better. But you can see that bright light beats even famous treatments, such as fluoxetine, the famous Prozac. You can see light hastens recovery from depression, either when given alone or when combined with drugs. And uh, now it's trivial, but at the beginning it was really hard. That was, uh, we can say that th this was a turning point for me when science uh, dedicated an editorial to what we were doing. And, and I said, okay, but at the beginning, people looked at us that we were some kind of strange witch healers, you know, uh, when we're treating with this new age treatment, light in the morning, sleep deprivation. But then we were able to show together with many, many researchers in the world that these techniques are effective to treat depression. And also there is a growing awareness that circadian disruption during the life can cause a lot of problems, you can see. And, and when, when it starts early in babies and children, it leads to uh, disturbances as depression, mania, uh, ADHD and whatever, and then obesity and then autoimmune diseases. How can this happen? We think that it is because the light is the main synchronizer of the biological clock. Everybody knows that the signal is delivered into the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and then with a long circuit, it goes to the pineal gland to release melatonin in the, in the evening in the darkness. And in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, there is a machinery of genes, which is directly activated by light. And then it regulates everything. You can see here the genes of the biological clock which go up and down, which they go up with light, and together with them, this is serotonin, neurotransmitters into the brain, potentiate their action. So light means more serotonin into the brain. Believe me, trust me, we don't have time to look at them one by one. Dopamine goes together, noradrenaline goes together, and even glutamate. And then from the biological clock, all the clocks in the or organisms are synchronized and even in the fetus during the development of the brain the biological clock is synchronized with the biological clock of the mother through the light which hits the retina of the mother synchronizes her biological rhythm which are then transferred as information to the fetus organizing a system which will guide our life on the planet for all our life and then through the rhythm of melatonin, season changes, photoperiod changes, and we are even synchronized with the seasonal change in availability of light and the position of the earth in the solar system. These two, uh, I don't know how you call them, spring box probably, know that it is time to choose their uh, females because it is autumn and they know this because the rhythms of melatonin and light have changed. We detect this and if we perturbate by lack of sunlight or by shift work or whatever this system, we perturbate neurotransmitters and we can have depression, you see. Black bile increases in autumn, said Hugues de Foulois, who was a monk in the Middle Age. You see, he was aware of this. Now we say serotonin decreases in winter, changing so much in autumn and spring as a function of how much daylight we have. And when serotonin goes down in winter, you say here that serotonin transporter goes up. And so serotonin is rapidly cleared from the synapse. When we have a lot of daylight, few serotonin transporters. And this is exactly the difference between people who have winter depression from people who are not. You can see here, these guys simply have a higher variation of these mechanisms. And this higher variation leads to depression 
And when we give light therapy, we change the thing, normalize them, and everything returns to the uh, previous situation and people uh, recover from depression. When it all started in the 80s, you can see here, uh, Dan Kripke treated non-seasonally depressed patients. Light is antidepressant independent of the seasonal rhythm because we now know two more things, two more mechanisms. One is this, when we are in the light, in our preferred timing, which is for, for nocturnal animals, darkness, for the urnal animals, light, we release a lot of dopamine. And this dopamine dampens the reactivity of our stress system. And we produce less cortisol and stress hormones in our preferred urinal period. So we are in the light less afraid of things. We have lower stress reaction to bad events. And this is true. We see also in uh, monkeys, this is a macaque, analyzing the hair of macaque monkeys. We see that macaques caged in uh, uh, cages which face south have lower cortisol into their hair, you see? And, and if that's a replication of what we did in our patients in, in, uh, wind, with windows facing east. And then another mechanism is that light directly impacts the limbic system. It has been discovered recently at the NIH, there is a specific system which prompts reactivity of the uh, cortical limbic system, decreases the reactivity of the amygdala to negative stimuli proportional to the exposure, even in humans. And we had shown, returning to my first slide previously, that this cortical limbic circuitry is disrupted in depression. And the more it is disrupted, the more suicidal thinking and planning you have. And you can see here that light directly improves it. So what we have learned is very simple. First of all, man and his environment are not separable and it is impossible to avoid exposure either to light, either to darkness, but lights triggers all these mechanisms which are antidepressant, anti-stress and promote our cortical limbic control of emotions and the cognitive generation of positive effects. And the second thing, maybe we understand why people, when they can, go immediately into the light. They, they do it all the day, you know, they do it all the time. When they have some free time and some money to spend, they spend their money to stay in the daylight. And that's my, uh, let's say, advice to all of you and to myself. Thanks very much for listening. Hope now I will be able to stop screen sharing and take questions if you are so. Thanks again. Thank you so much for explaining why we should go outdoors in the sunlight and why it's good for our mood and health and our, our, our well-being in that sense. So thanks very much for, for this, this rather intense also introduction into that topic. Um, we have some questions from the audience, and I saw that there was already some questions were answered, but I will just ask the first question. Um, um, it's maybe a bit in depth, but uh, do you know if babies inherit the biological clock of their mothers? So it's a bit, maybe not directly in, in that sense, but do you know how that works? There are two, th two ways. I mean, uh, the clock machinery, the biological machinery of the central clock is made of genes, which are expressed in loops. And of course, genes have variants. So we inherit several alleles as for everything, you know, and so we have certain characteristics endogenous, let's say, that may cause more serotonin, more uh, early births and whatever. I'm a very serotonin people person. I've always been. But more than this, probably during the development of the brain, the stimuli which come from the eye of the mother, so from the daylight to which the mother is, uh, is exposed to, mm -hmm. also shape the way in which the epigenetic expression of these genes will then happen uh, during all the life. And so there is, a, there is an interaction of two things. 
And yes, something is genetically irritable, something is irritable via non-genetic mechanisms. By the way, I have to answer to your first question, translation and reverse translation. Translation yes. is going from animal borders to the patient, you see, from bench to the bed to the bedside. And, but, but we are also interested to the other way around. We study mechanisms into the brain of our patient, then we want to understand what happens, and then we do to, to, to cellular models and whatever, and this is the reverse translation of perspective. We always circle, <laughs> we are rhythmic, you know, yeah. we are rhythmic in nature. Yeah, 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 yeah. I thank you very much for also explaining that to me. So, so very happy to also get that knowledge right in that sense. Um, so I'm going to another question. Um, how can we know if our biological clock is in or out of sync with nature? If it's not in sync, how do we correct it with the daylight? So that's that's the question here. Yeah, that's a, that's also contains the answer. We don't know very well there because it's very difficult to measure rhythms because you should take blood samples, let's say every quarter of an hour of the day to see if your hormonal rhythms are all in balance. This cannot be done at this moment. Uh, but one way is that you are certainly aware of if you are sleeping well, if you are uh, well awake during the day, if you have the normal homeostatic oscillation of energy, rest and activity. If this is out, if the clock is out of, of sync, people will uh, lose the powerful effect that they light has on uh, memory and attention and will feel uh, this cognitive fog uh, during the day. And maybe they will awaken a lot of time at night. How to correct this without taking sleeping pills? I mean, the, the way is only one, to expose themselves to explore to expose themselves to the synchronizing stimuli, which are light in the day, in the morning especially, but throughout all the day, and complete darkness at night, uh, avoiding also this uh, artificial light pollution that we have during the night. So re-establishing the rhythm of melatonin during the night and activated mechanisms by light during the day. That's, what I, that's my advice. So actually to follow the rhythm of the daylight in this sense. Yeah, to follow the rhythm of the earth, of the planet uh, on which we developed. I mean, that's, uh, we, are, we have been around for a lot of years, you know, and, uh, and we developed <laughs> our mechanisms, adapted them to this planet. Then we closed them ourselves into concrete, you know, like these macaques who were put in cages mm -hmm. and they needed to face light, to not feel stress. That, that's e equal for us. So go outside and take yeah. the light. Then it's okay. So, and the next question is a bit related to that one. So question is, which is the best time of the day for light exposure to improve your moods? But is that, is yeah. that a, a question to be asked or is it? Yeah, yeah, it's a very nice question because there has been a lot of research on this. At the beginning, I have to say, the idea was to enlarge the photo period. So to give light both in the, in the morning and in the evening to create a summer day in the middle of the winter. Then we understood, a lot of people understood, that the synchronizing effects on the clock were higher when you give light in the morning. So there's no need to give it in the evening to have an antidepressant effect. But to improve everything else, energy, attention, there is the light during the day, which is very important. We are uh, uh, in the lack of this. We have chronically lacking light during the day because we live into rooms with small windows and whatever. And so in this sense, what I would advise is to take light whenever during the day you, you can, okay? But to specifically target depression and combine light with antidepressant drugs, the early morning is the more sensitive moment. But it has been shown that light is however superior to placebo during all the day, also for antidepressant purposes. So it's, uh, yeah, you know, I think I'd answer it. <laughs> okay, then, I, yeah, we have time for just one last question. Um, why does specific blue light have such an impact for suicidal attempts and how does that actually work? Can you explain? About yeah, that? yeah, that's a nice question because, you know, it's, uh, it's even debated. I'm not so sure of this. I mean, it was used blue light because at the beginning, when at the NIH, they showed that the ganglionar cells connected to 
the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus, so to the master clock, are especially responsive to blue light. And so they started all putting blue light everywhere. But what we know now is that the other system, which is the, probably the most interesting for our purposes, for our psychiatric purposes, so the ganglionar cells who connect the retina directly to the limbic system, well, they skip the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So to obtain that effect, probably you don't need blue light, but you need wide, uh, bright light, uh, uh, wide spectrum light. This has not been uh, certainly defined. There are studies on this. My advice is to take wide light, in the, the, the more, which is the light from the sun, I mean, that's uh, it's, uh, our stimulus. But, but this blue light uh, frenzy was due to the fact that the first ganglionar cells identified were especially responsive to it. I think uh, bright white light can be superior to both. Blue light, uh, red light, but, but red light is not ineffective. I mean, every kind of light has some effects by directly targeting the limbic system. Okay, well, that, that's at least interesting. So what you're actually saying, okay, the blue light, that's something, but the real daylight, so the real stuff, the full spectrum, that's the thing full to spectrum. go for. Bright white light, that's a lamp we use in the hospital and there are also some studies which affirm their superiority. And by the way, I see there are a lot of questions. I will try to answer them by typing uh, in, the, in the following minutes, okay? Yeah. And uh, if, you, if I don't and you have uh, the essential need of having my answer, please mail me. You find my email uh, on the internet on every paper I wrote. Don't expect a rapid response. <laughs> but if I don't respond in a week, send, send the mail again, okay? Okay, so audience, you know, you are invited to ask your questions. If he doesn't ask the, answer those during this meeting, by sending an email. So thank you very much for this interesting uh, presentation uh, from your side. Thanks um, very much. And the next one, I would like to introduce our um, next uh, speaker. So the third and the last in line. So last but not least, as they used to say, so we have Dr. Sharna Dibna uh, with a background in molecular uh, biology and chronobiology. Uh, she's working in a laboratory of circadian and endocrinology, sorry, too many words, uh, division of en endocrinology, diabetes and nutrition at the University of Geneva, Switzerland. And she's renowned for her work and expertise in the field of circadian clocks and moreover, uh, in relation to diabetes. So, um, Dr. Ch uh, Dibner, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Marielle, for this nice introduction. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to see, um, to see so many of you attending. I'm also very grateful to the organizers um, um, for the session to being built in such a logical manner and to uh, Francesco Benedetti, who made a, a, a wonderful introduction, actually, um, to the connection between the, the circadian uh, rhythm, uh, light, and metabolism. Um, so, um, Let's start because from all the uh, problematic that, uh, that you were exposed to today, I think this one is less intuitive, right? Because we are opaque. So our metabolic organs are, are, are way inside and uh, it's difficult to imagine how your liver, for example, can feel light. But Francesco already uh, gave you some insights to that and let me um, continue uh, on this connection. I'm also particularly grateful to the person who asked the question uh, uh, regarding recommendation how should we measure actually if we are synchronized with the environment or not, and uh, and uh, what should we do about it? So I hope to enlighten you on that in in the upcoming ten minutes. So as you already saw um, today and yesterday, um, the the connection between light and and physiology is is going by the circadian system, and circadian comes from Latin circadian about the day, right? And if you ask me to to characterize the system in one word, I would say anticipation. Indeed. This intrinsic circadian system make us to anticipate the rotation of Earth on a daily basis, right? And thus, it is not surprising that most of the aspects of our physiology behavior are rhythmic, not only rest activity or sleep-wake cycle, but also, uh, for example, visual acuity and pain sensitivity, they are rhythmic with the cycle of about 24 hours. 
Now, in a normal year, I would give you an example of this system, um, jet lag, right? You travel from Switzerland to US and, the, and the across time zones, you are jet lag. Today, we um, almost forgot what's jet lag about. So this is another example, chronotype, that already Francesco also mentioned that extensively. Uh, we are genetically encoded. And what was believed uh, 20 years ago, that if you are not fully concentrated on the seven o'clock uh, at the morning meeting, does not mean that you are lazy. It might mean that you are just late all, right? So this system is genetic, and we will come back to this notion of chronotype, uh, again, to the question um, that was asked um, by somebody to Francesca, um, how can we personalize this, this light exposure and so on? So here is again the recapitulation from what Francesco already said. Uh, we are opaque, right? So this connection between the light and metabolic organs is coming uh, via hypothalamus central clock, SCN, which is a conductor that drives uh, all the rhythmic physiology and behavior. And in turn, this so-called peripheral or slave oscillators operative in the organs, they would synchronize the, the whole complexity of metabolic reaction depending on the specific organ function. Now, circadian misalignment, uh, right? So that was, again, this wonderful question. Uh, how do we know that we are desynchronized uh, with the environment? Um, so yeah, I mean, in scientific terms, we call it circadian misalignment. It means that our internal clocks and external cues are not exactly aligned. Obvious examples are acute uh, phase shift when we go or jet lag when we go from, from Switzerland to States or to Japan, uh, or, or people who work in shifts right here in hospital. But actually all of us, uh, and I can tell you that we are going through, through tremendous epidemics aside of COVID, which is an epidemic of metabolic disease, obesity. That is something that is really constantly growing uh, over the last decades. And we think now that this is largely related to this phenomenon of, of social jet lag uh, that we, most of us in our 24 seven society experience at least to some extent. One example was the late alls who are obliged to come to the seven o'clock meeting on a daily basis. So, so we do experience this chronic uh, social jet lag or circadian misalignment. Why this is bad? As you could see in the previous talk, uh, sleep disorders, uh, depression, but also all sorts of, of diseases, including metabolic disease that would be a subject of, of my uh, talk in particular. So my laboratory of circadian endocrinology, as you hear it, um, is uh, uh, so our core expertise, um, and that will answer you precisely to the question how at the molecular level we can uh, actually measure this misalignment. We are doing molecular research of, on human peripheral clock. And this is not obvious, but we develop uh, um, several focuses. And I will just give you one example um, on one of the very important metabolic organs, which is endocrine pancreas, right? Uh, islets of Langerhans. And this is, uh, uh, this is the part in our body in endocrine system that is responsible for secreting insulin and glucagon, two counter hormones that are essential uh, for maintaining the, the glucose balance in the blood. So you probably know that, that uh, this balance of insulin and glucagon, this is uh, a core of physiopathology of, of diabetes um, that is also constantly raising uh, nowadays. So what I show you here are actually human pancreatic islets. And what we are doing at the molecular level, we actually follow the clocks in these uh, pancreatic islets at the cellular level. So what you will see here is in red, we have a marker for beta cells, human beta cells that secrete insulin. In green, we have here uh, glucagon that is marker of, of alpha cells. Um, and uh, here in white or in blue, we have actually this specific reporter that marks molecular clocks in this uh, uh, pancreatic blood cells. So this movie that I show you is actually lasting three days. And so this is accelerated, right? And so we can follow in real time actually and quantify, as you can see here, the profiles of molecular clocks operative in alpha and beta cells in human pancreatic blood. So when we compared such recording um, in the islets derived from the donors uh, who are uh, non-diabetic or metabolically healthy and those who have uh, type two diabetes, we could see that these clocks are actually broken. They are much less synchronized in type two diabetic islets. So aside of scientific interest, why this is important? This is important because as I mentioned, the cells are secreting insulin and glucagon and these clocks are responsible uh, for their uh, uh, temporal regulation. So what can we do about it? 
what we tried to do, and that was led by Vladimir Petrenko and Milo Borgu. So Vladimir found a small molecule nobility that is derived from lemon peel that actually was shown to boost, to resynchronize the clock in mice. So we did translational research, we dropped mobility and Vladimir dropped mobility on human uh, type 2D islets, and he restored the clocks. What happened in parallel also, the insulin function, the insulin secretion function by these stem cells was improved. So that could be one way, such approach of clock modulators of resynchronizing the clocks and thus maybe restoring the function of metabolic cortex. Now to the question that was asked to Francesca, how else we can do it? We can do it by lifestyle adaptation. And here we have another actively ongoing project um, together with uh, wonderful clinical collaborations uh, from Ashuja and Shu and um, uh, from other collaborators. So here I show you how we can actually measure the clocks and how we can resynchronize them without using pharmacological agents, but by lifestyle adaptation. Here the idea that you can resynchronize your clock with, with specific time windows of eating. And that is what we are doing now. And uh, so we have all sorts of, of sensors that can measure by actigraphy and, and uh, blood analysis and, and um, cellular analysis, we can really quantify these clocks. And in parallel, we also measure uh, the food intake, so what people eat and when do they eat by the application developed by Marcel Salate. And the person who brought light in this project was Marilyn Anderson from EPFL. And she shared with us her wonderful uh, uh, latest invention, this Spectrus uh, wearable uh, sensor that would sense light so in addition to, to the record of food and timing of food, we also uh, use this light sensor. So we hope to have uh, the whole idea. And the, the idea is also to actually tailor the specific time window to an individual chronotype. So if I'm early type, it's good for me to, eat, uh, to restrict my eating to, to early hours. And if you are late type, so this recommendation with breakfast, you eat it entirely, does not work for you so well. So that is something that we would like now to... Uh, to develop and, and to see exactly um, if this is true or not and what is the molecular basis. Now to further shine the light and, and to address really direct connection between the light exposure and body metabolism. So we have a wonderful collaborators in Maastricht. Uh, this is the Maastricht uh, unit led by Patrick Schrauen and uh, Jan Frieder uh, Harmsen and Joris, the lab of Joris Works. Um, they have this facility where I can really um, measure, they, they make light exposure, and they measure uh, all sorts of metabolic parameters in people. The idea of this project is very uh, simple. So as uh, Francesca told you, in principle, our ancestors, you know, we didn't have, they didn't have electric lights. So like night eating disorders were not, was not an issue in the past, right? So the idea is very simple, is to increase the light exposure during our physiological activity phase and to, to, to decrease the, the light exposure during the night. Now here is the protocol. So we have uh, part of the participants uh, that are exposed to, we call it bright day, dim evening, or on the contrary. So how, to the question, how do we measure it? We take blood in certain time points and we do all sorts of, so this is in Maastricht, they do all sorts of metabolic analysis. Um, so the participants are in this super controlled conditions, right? So everything is controlled, eating, light exposure, and, and then the outcomes are the metabolic uh, profile at all different levels, the, the uh, clockwork. And we also measure, so this is my part, we're measuring molecular clocks in different primary tissues from the same patients. So where we hope to come with that is, is to develop personalized light schedules that would be tailored to individual chronotypes of, on the participants. To summarize, um, but, um, I hope to convince you that, that we, most of us are, are, are um, experiencing this, this, as we call, chronic circadian misalignment, and that perturbed light schedule with both dim light uh, during, lack of light during the day and excessive light during nights is um, not so great for, for our uh, metabolism, right? It could be, uh, could be basis for, for growing epidemics of, of metabolic diseases. Um, and indeed it was shown at molecular level. I just showed you our recent work with type two diabetes in human. We see that the regulated clocks are associated with metabolic diseases in humans. Now, how can we fix this broken clocks? That's the question, right? So we can use personalized light schedule. We can use other lifestyle adaptation. What I've shown you is this time-restricted eating protocol could be 
also, also timely exercise. And um, another way is clock modulators, like what I've shown you, the example with Nibu. So with that, I would really uh, like to thank a wonderful team uh, in my lab who did uh, um, this work, Vladimir Petrenko, especially, and Flossi and Turel, our collaborators, uh, funding agencies, Velux, uh, of course, Daylight Academy for this wonderful event. And um, yeah, I hope you have many questions. And uh, also um, to follow on what Francesca said, if I do not have time to respond to all of your questions, please, I'm in Charna Dibnar. Uh, you find my email easily. I'm happy to, to continue on the discussion also after the event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this, this presentation and also to demonstrate how different factors um, actually influence our health and, and also the questions that are still out there, I think, so that researchers have still enough work to be doing and also to connect those, those different insights as well. Mm. So I, I'm, I'm also having, of course, the audience has some, some questions for you. And I'm also checking uh, which ones would be the most most interesting. Well, I, there was some, and I will just ask more in general. So there was a question, how can you determine your biological clock? So where you actually are? And, and in addition to that one also, how do you do that for in your chronotherapy, therapeutic approaches? How do you assess circadian phase? to determine your internal time. So I think they're interrelated to that one. Right, so first questionnaires, right? So if you go on, um, so there is Munich uh, chronotype questionnaire. If you type uh, Munich chronotype questionnaire, I think their server is now down. I just checked it yesterday, but the principle is very, very easy. You know, you ask yourself, what are you doing on working days? But most importantly, what are you doing on free days? So on your free days, when you're on vacation, let's say when, when you detach yourself from your work schedule, you know what you are, right? And it, it is also not fixed throughout your lifetime because if you have adolescents at home, you know that they are very late. And in Munich, there was a wonderful experiment uh, done uh, on the adolescent when they just delayed, you know, the, the uh, timing of, of the starting time. I mean, from seven o'clock in the morning in the high school to 10 o'clock in the morning, they significantly improved and their well-being and, and their academic performance. So it does have an impact, but how do you know? That's how you ask yourself on the free days, um, how are you? Do you like to stay late intrinsically or, or do you like, like uh, for me, I know that I'm super early, right? So, so that, that uh, no doubt, but, um, and on the molecular level, uh, what I showed you, of course, we don't take eyelids from people, but uh, we do tiny um, skin biopsy we establish the fibroblast, we use this retinian reporter, and we know what is your chronotype. But very simple, I mean, just go to the questionnaire, and even before the questionnaire, ask yourself, um, how do you behave on your free days? Uh, when you are, we call it free running, when you go to vacation and you don't have any constraints, um, how do you like to, to behave? And I think usually you know. Okay, and that's also the way you are doing in, in the research that you're mentioning here? Is that also the way? Oh, yeah. No, so, so we have, um, first we, we record the activity and that is quite precise, right? So we have in the sensors, I was probably mm -hmm. not specific, the slide was probably overloaded, right? But, but there they are all sorts of sensors already by measuring your activity. We know when you are active and when you are sleeping, sleeping temperature sensors, and so on and so forth. So that uh, that is very that is quite precise. And now these weird, easily wearable devices are uh, uh, very accessible and very cheap actually. And so so you can definitely buy buy yourself a bracelet actigraph, and already by that you roughly know. And then again at molecular level, um, we do something. For example, we can establish your cells. I have mine in the lab, mm -hmm. and we can really record. Uh, we can synchronize them in the dish, and then we can measure our clocks, manipulate them, and so on and so forth. But um, first approximation after the questionnaire is is the devices that measure your activity written, temperature written. Um, yeah, now we started also measuring light exposure and so on and so forth. Yeah, but also to connect that maybe in the future to that one. Um, yeah. and another question that is um, maybe a bit, bit more um, general. I'm just looking in that one. Um, yeah, well, I think that's also an interesting one. So uh, in northern latitudes, such as Sweden, there's a question. Uh, we are, so assuming this person is from Sweden, we are exposed to low daylight levels during the winter. How do you how to adapt our clocks to 
uh, this abrupt difference between summer and winter. So thank you. Yeah, wonderful question. So so Francesca already answered it big time. So melatonin, the key is melatonin. So we have this wonderful hormone uh, that has a double regulation, beautiful double regulation by circadian clocks and by light. So, so that that is our link, and and the, the regulation is reciprocal because actually the the place which is most abundantly uh, with most abundant expression of melatonin receptor is the central clock SCM. So that's how. So when you have less light, uh, there is melatonin, and this is uh, you know in US you can even buy it without prescription. This is a major phase shifter. So if you want to you know once we are through with these epidemics and we start to travel. I mean, many people just take it, you know, to, to because it, it shifts your phase immediately. And that was happened in northern latitude exactly. So you have uh, during the winter, you have uh, high levels of melatonin, and that will resynchronize your clocks accordingly. So that is a phase shifter that allows us this uh, to follow the seasonality, of course. Yeah. For those of us who are not at the equator where it's. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, well, we have so a difference. That, that, yeah, melatonin is the key. Yeah. That's the one. Okay, I have another question and it's more in depth again. So is it about diabetes type one? So the genetic one or the type two or both? Yeah, So thank you. Uh, so so it's, it's mostly type two. It's true, I should. I mean, it was written type two D, type two D. But so the thing is that for type one diabetes, it's extremely complicated. It might be also, but we really do not know. With autoimmune disease, we really cannot say. So what I said, it mostly, thank you for this question. Yeah, I mean, it was written on the slide, but I was not explicit on that. And that is a wonderful question. So this is mostly applying to type 2 diabetes. And what I've shown with human pancreatic is there was definitely type 2 diabetes. So yes, type 2 diabetes mostly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Tarina, for this, this uh, uh, presentation again. So now we have some time for more general questions as well. So, um, and, and we have been collecting those as well. So, um, and the question there is, and it's, it's a more general one maybe, um, um, would human-centric lighting help in commercial places such as retail showrooms for general lighting and in offices and how? And I know this is quite an applied question, but maybe the question to, to generalize a bit bit bigger so can we actually also um you know we we're talking about daylight um uh, can we uh, also implement artificial lighting to uh, get the similar effects that you have been talking about related to health so first i would of course ask i go to line i see richard there in my screen so richard if you could try to answer is human-centric lighting a solution or are we looking at at the real stuff here so the real daylight. I, I would I would defer to to Professor Benedetti on this one. I think he probably <laughs> okay. knows more than I do about uh, the effects of light. Um, I, I mean, as as far as uh, myopia is concerned, I, I, I uh, it, it's a very un under researched area. My concern is always that that um, a, as we saw in the nineteen sixties, is that artificial light is, is used as a substitute for the real thing. And that's always a concern for me with buildings, because there are things that uh, windows give you that uh, human centric light doesn't. For example, a fire escape. Anyway, uh, so yes, I'll, I'll so hand if, over to the professor on that. But in your context, okay. you would say, OK, we would go for the real daylight in this. Sense. Oh, if possible. Yeah. I mean, obviously, that's, possible. that's an okay. extreme position. Okay. But but um, but yeah, the nearer the nearer you can get the light to the natural spectrum, the better. But um, OK, yeah. thank you for that one. Uh, uh, Dr. Benedetti? Yeah, I will also, be, I will also say that uh, there have been attempts at potentiating light, you know, by putting a lot of blue into it. And this is not sure to be a, a, a healthy, safe thing, because, of course, you perturbate the system. And uh, what we adapted to in the earth uh, was uh, adaptation to bright white light. I wouldn't advise to put the special stuff uh, that uh, are... Uh, uh, I have to say, unfortunately, available because they can give you an headache, you know, by by stimulating too much certain systems and not certain others. I mean, uh, all these uh, uh, connections that we are discovering one by one connect the retina with many areas of the brain. And then uh, at the beginning, we studied these blue light stuff, uh, which stimulate the circadian clock. But then now we know that there is the limbic system and the limbic system is responsible for emotions. So um, we would uh, uh, 
what I suggest is to try to simulate uh, the more daylight we can. Of course, uh, it's impossible because we are not completely aware of the mechanistic effects of light into the brain. So how can we simulate it perfectly? Yes, okay. if we cannot do anything else, that, that's good. But, you know, always mm. being very skeptical about the idea of putting a little sun into a room because uh, it's not that. Okay, so that's clear. So maybe once we ac actually know how this, these mechanisms work, we might translate those to maybe an artificial, because we are also lose, using light therapy devices, for example, or, sure, sure. and that also seemed to have an effect. Okay, good. Thank you for that answer. Uh, Dr. Dibner, Sharna? Yes. So, sorry, you... I was typing something, but <laughs> <laughs> what should I... <laughs> I'm not multitask. So, I was yeah, very yeah. there are so no. many exciting questions here. So, sorry, can, can you repeat no, no, no. <laughs> Well, the, the question is is um, whether um, uh, um, we can simulate the, 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 the lighting in this case for generating the effects by using artificial light or out, the way we call it nowadays, human-centric lighting, or is in your opinion still the daylights and all its aspects is, is that, could it be replaced in your sense to prevent or? I mean, he, here I would follow Francesca. I mean, use as much light as possible. I mean, of course, if you can have daylight, wonderful, but we live in a reality, right? So, so I think uh, whatever exposure you can have, but that's also in a way what we are trying with Maastricht people, what we're trying to address and uh, we shall see um, how does that compare? I mean, I completely agree with Francesco that, uh, I mean, of course, I mean, go to the sunshine uh, whenever you can, but uh, then uh, we have to, I mean, we have to deal with what we have, right? Uh, so, so I think uh, we should definitely co co consider artificial substitutes in, in our reality. So, so yeah, so one of the goals of the projects that I showed you in a nutshell is, is to see uh, how this, because there they, they use obviously office light. Um, to what extent it substitutes and how, how it can boost your metabolism in, if used uh, in a scheduled manner. Uh. Okay, so uh, we have some, some at least some discussion on the topic, so that, that's at least uh, a good. And I think also a question for, for all uh, three of you, and then maybe I will start with you, Sharna, is um, um, what the impact is on lighting day and night time. So what is your advice actually um, to, to, to protect the bodies in this case. So what is then a healthy light scheme in your sense that we should actually, well, yeah, I know it's, it's, it's yeah, yeah, the no, practicality no, of question. life. <laughs> because we usually had it. I mean, I'm, I'm actually quite uh, since a few years only into, into light because before we were mostly in the eating and then, you know, it's as, as always, I love these questions because do I know what to do? Yes. Do I do it? No. Of course, what we should do, we should, in, by all means, avoid staring in our mobiles during the night. That would be a huge step forward. And then there was a question, I lost it now, but there was a question about, you know, all this screen saver and attenuating. The, I mean, it works only to some extent, unfortunately. And the right in the circadian field, uh, Francesco brought a wonderful uh, paper by Summer Atar. So Summer had another publication that, that, that actually this, this screen, you know, protectors, they, they are not perfect. So yeah, I mean, decreasing screen time in the evening hours and during mm -hmm. the night. But yeah, I'm the first one not to do it. So, so actually, you have this exciting emails right during the night and you have to respond immediately. Yeah. So that would be one huge step. And uh, yeah, here again, I would totally agree with Francesco that I mean, as much uh, exposure to daily light as you can, that would be a huge step. Yeah. And, and all the fine tuning is coming on top of this. Of course, we want to synchronize it to our chronotype. But I mean, let's stick to reality. And, First, get as, as least light possible. I mean, just ma make your night dim as dim as possible and make your yeah. days as bright as possible. And then let's tailor into the chronotype. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at the time. So I would love also to, to but I have to have uh, uh, the other two panel panelists answer that, that question, but maybe I'll make it a bit more condensed in that sense. So would you, would you all suggest to follow the daily rhythm? In this case, is it that we have to go back to to nature again? Is is that the case, or do you disagree on that one? No, no, I agree perfectly. If I can say, 
And uh, the idea is this, that it's uh, not my idea. I have to say I, I, I took it from Till Rönneberg, this idea that we are living in a kind of sh short circuit because we do not expose ourselves to light during the day. But when you have a sufficient amount of light during the day and in the morning, you will sleep better at night because your circadian rhythms will be synchronized. And so you will not need to take sleeping pills or take melatonin, which a lot of people do, including me when I am, go abroad and I, and I have a jet lag. But, but it shouldn't be done in normal conditions because the light during the day, bright light during the day, would also prompt these oscillations with deep rest and during the night. And so uh, the idea is to avoid pollution, okay? We pollute the day with darkness and we pollute the night with too much light. So it's, yeah, well, it's, you know, they were telling me at the beginning that I was a kind of a new age person, you know, and then now everything cites this and, and this is an accepted treatment. But that's it. Uh, avoid pollution. It's, it's uh, we adapted to this earth rotating on itself, exposing ourselves to light and darkness. And this is how our brain developed over several millions of years because, you know, the first uh, man to go around uh, all around the earth was Homo erectus, who stayed around two millions of years <laughs> and, there was, and they were everywhere. Then we come now and build all these uh, concrete blocks and start artificial lightning and uh, the pressure goes up. That's, that's my idea, okay? Okay, so now... <laughs> Thank you very much that, that you kind of agree on, on, on that topic. Richard, you also agree or you disagree on this one? Um, no yeah, one of, one of my interests is hospital design and how hospitals used to be built and, and used and when, when sunlight therapy was used and so on. And, and they always used to black out the wards at night. Um, and some doctors said the, 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 the darkness in the wards is not, at night was as important as the sunlight during the day. Um, so obviously they felt then that it had a, the contrast between having a lot of daylight during the day and then having the darkness at night was very beneficial. So there is, if you like, a sort of therapeutic side to this as well as a sort of daily activity. Um, uh, oh, the other, only other thing I would say is that one of the other things I studied for many years was, was Tai Chi. And that is done traditionally at dawn. And I remember saying to the, uh, one of the instructors once, why do you do it facing east? And of course, he gave me a clip around the ear and said, because that's where the sun's coming up. So, yeah, I mean, there are ways of, of you know, if you look at traditional ways of doing things, you find out that there are lessons we can learn from them. OK, well, thank you very much. We are running out of time. So thanks for, for the speakers for, for having these wonderful presentations here and enlightening us again on how daylight would actually work for, for our health and staying healthy, of course. Um, I want to wrap it up and I have one last uh, Mentimeter uh, a question for you. And um, it is about, so if you could go back again, so take your phone, go back to www.menti.com and use the code 65010-2266. Then we have the last question. So what is the first thing that you will do once this webinar is over? And well, it's not getting dark here yet. So you have some time to, to, to do things outdoors maybe. Um, so is it uh, um, plan an everyday walk or other exercise outdoors? Is it activate my kids to play outdoors for fun, but also for better health. Go quickly outdoors to enjoy the last rays of today's sunshine. Well, you have to be quick. Tell my friends to watch the recorded version. They need to know. Um, sign up for tomorrow's session. So you need to do that anyways. Uh, on daylight, the guides, plants, animals, and humans through seasons. Okay, go outdoors. That's at least a lesson that, that you are taking home. Tell my friends that there's a recording. So we're also happy that, that you can share the information of today. Um, so we're very pleased uh, about that. Oh yeah, and I missed the one, watch my favorite series. 
I need to clear my head. So no one's going to do that. So I think also the presenters that that we did not overwhelm our audience too much and uh, give them the inspiration to to work on daylight in that sense. So thank you very much again for sharing it all with us. And then I will give the word back again to Lydia, who will close up this session for now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Marielle. And thank you to all speakers for the fascinating and very lively talks. And of course, I also would like to thank all participants again for joining and for participating with so many interesting questions. So it was really a pleasure to have you all. And before we go, I just would like to remind you that the Daylight Awareness Week continues tomorrow, as you have seen in the, the, our last question on Mentimenter. We have a last session and uh, we would be delighted to have you participating again, of course. It will be a round table with four great speakers um, who will represent very different disciplines. And together with them, we will have a discussion about a third reason why daylight is important. And this reason is daylight guides plants, animals and humans through seasons. So we will have, we will take a broader view and look at our natural environment and at the role daylight plays in these seasonal rhythms and how this affects nature and including us, of course, humans. So if you haven't registered yet, you can still do it. Um, you will find everything on the Daylight Academy website. And yeah, so let's close our session here. Thank you very much again to everybody and have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.